District of Conservation is sponsored by CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to CFACT.org. Thank you so much for listening. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. That was The Heartbreak Kid by friend of the show, my frequent collaborator, and good friend, Madison Hughes. What did you guys think of the song? If you like it, I've included links to the Spotify and elsewhere where you can find it. It perfectly meshes well with conservation, the outdoors, the feeling of heartbreak, especially when you lose a coveted fish or wildlife game species. With it being a holiday weekend, America's 247th birthday, It's a perfect time to go fishing and boating. Hunting is kind of light unless you're doing predator management. We on the East Coast are hunkering down a bit. We have some storms, tornadoes, wind advisories slated for the region, even impacting 4th of July. So I won't be able to go fishing and hunting. I had a beach day planned, but I can always postpone it. Nevertheless, today is a more low-key episode. I have a phenomenal interview with News on 6 anchor, and a new friend of mine, Tess Mani. She is an anchor reporter for the morning news in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We recently connected after being first introduced via social media. I was really impressed by her. And when we were looking for keynote speakers at our recent POMA annual conference, business conference that was held in Broken Arrow, I got the idea to reach out to her, give her a pitch, and she gladly accepted. And we welcomed her and hosted her at our dinner. And I would say the response was very positive. I had a lot of members come to me afterwards about how impressed they were with Tess, and I think all of you listening will be impressed with her. I won't go too much into detail. She has a very extensive background in media reporting, and it's really refreshing to see more news reporters and journalists actively living the hunting and fishing lifestyle and reporting on it objectively and getting that direct experience that often is required and needed to objectively report on these very subjects. So I will let Tess Mani take it away from here. I hope you get to know her, follow her work. Really impressive. And I hope more journalists follow her lead. Thanks for listening today and happy 4th of July. Tess, it is so great to catch up with you after meeting you in Oklahoma. How are things going? And glad to hear that you got power back. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Thanks for having me, first of all. And things are really good. Yeah. Oklahoma had a huge um windstorm last week and i did not have power for six days there were other people who um went almost 10 days with no power in the oklahoma heat which is just miserable anyway but especially when you don't have power but everything's back up and running so feeling pretty good now that's wonderful i wouldn't want to be in that position i know how bad you know power outages can be so that's not a comfortable position good that power was restored but Today, I want to focus, and and while I have you on, we want to focus on what makes you really stand out, in my opinion, as a journalist. And I I was really drawn to your uh, social media accounts. I forget exactly how I came across it, but maybe the algorithm sent it my way, and that was a good thing, uh, because the (laughs) algorithm sends really crazy stuff. But somehow, either someone mentioned you or said, you should connect with this person. They're also a journalist in media. And I was just so impressed by the fact that you're a journalist, you're covering the outdoors, what led you first to go into journalism before we talk about all your work covering this beat? Because everyone has a story for going into journalism. I want to hear what yours is. And I think my listeners do too. Yeah, absolutely. So I knew from the time I was 10 years old that I wanted to work in television news. Um, And unfortunately it's, you know, it was a bad, horrible tragedy that happened in Oklahoma Uh, that led me to that. But the Oklahoma City bombing happened in 1995. And um, I was 10 years old and just glued to the TV. My family always watched news. So it was a big part of our life anyway. But it was that event that really showed me the importance and the value of journalism. And even at the young age of 10, I understood what was going on. And I understood the work of those journalists who were out there uh, I mean, it was wall-to-wall coverage for two weeks, 
And it just, um, it just made me want to be part of that world so I could be the one gathering that information and getting it out to Oklahomans and to viewers, uh, just like the people that I was watching on the news. So from that moment on, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And so that's what I pursued in college. I never changed my mind. And um, a week after college, I moved to Arkansas. I was a producer first, and then I started reporting. And then that led to anchoring. And now I do a little bit of both. Yes. And could you tell everyone who is not familiar with your station, which company you're a part of? Yeah. So I work for Griffin Media in Oklahoma. I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And Griffin Griffin is a, a locally owned, Oklahoma owned company. And uh, we have a station in Tulsa, which is News on 6, KOTV News on 6, and um, KWTV News 9 in Oklahoma City. And we're both CBS affiliates. Wonderful. What led you to become interested in covering this? You talked about this during your keynote at our POMA conference, but was it because you recognized that few people in the industry were really focusing on this topic? Um, uh, on the, because on you had the a personal outdoors? connection? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, it kind of, I fell into it accidentally when we had a beloved meteorologist here at News on 6, Dick Furrow, and he was known for taking young reporters, new reporters, out for fishing trips when they started at News on 6. And so with me and another reporter, he took us noodling, which is hand fishing for catfish. So you go into the lake or to the river, creeks, whatever, and you try to catch catfish with just your hands by putting your hands into, a, you know, a dark, scary hole, or at least that's what I thought at the time, to catch catfish. And so that was really my first opportunity and uh, really true introduction to doing things in the outdoors. I'd had a few experiences when I was younger, uh, but that really kind of lit a fire in me. And a couple of weeks later, I ended up going on another noodling trip with a different group of people because we, we didn't catch a fish on the first one. We wanted to catch a fish. So we went with a different group of people. And um, as it turns out, the guide that day is now my husband. <laughs> so he's not a fishing guide. He, um, he is actually a wildlife biologist. So that was uh, almost 11 years ago. Um, it'll be 11 years on July 15th that we met and we've been together ever since. And so that was my introduction to the outdoors. And I had just recently started working for News on 6. And so then I'm meeting Matt, my husband, who is a wildlife biologist with the state of Oklahoma, so kind of our, our life and our love story was intertwined with the outdoors and I was learning a lot from him. And so as my knowledge grew and I was learning new things about the outdoors, I thought, well, this sounds like a story or this, this seems like it would be something our viewers would be interested in. And so I, I just kind of started, you know, pitching stories that were outdoor centric. Sometimes I'd be, you know, told no, and I'd have to go, you know, do more general assignment news stories. Um, and then sometimes I would be told yes. And um, as kind of our viewers grew to, me, grew to know me a little bit more, um, I was able to do more stories in the outdoors. So kind of as popularity grew, popularity in the outdoors, and I became more familiar, management here was like, okay, okay, this is something. People really, really do engage with this. They do connect with this and they do relate to it. And so that's kind of how it started. I I, I went on that noodling story. I met my husband, who is a, a lifelong outdoorsman. And then I became interested in it. And so I tried to find every way that I could to incorporate it into my work, which is pretty cool that I get to do that. And what is the segment that you have featuring outdoor stories? So I have two. One of them may seem small, but I think it makes a big impact for a lot of people. Every morning I share outdoor pictures. So hunting and fishing pictures typically might be cute, you know, wildlife animal pictures. And it's called Outdoor Adventures with Tess. So viewers send me in, you know, the the catch they made. It could be a sunfish that they caught at the farm pond the day before. And then I feature that um, twice a morning on News on 6. And then we also have the Outdoor Life with Tess, which is sponsored by Academy. And that's um, a series of stories that uh, I've really tried to use it to feature other people in the outdoors and not just myself, uh, because I think it's important for folks to see that it's not just me doing it. We have so many people here in Oklahoma and across the country who are involved in the outdoors, who are hunting, who are fishing, who are noodling. Maybe they're doing shooting sports. You know, there are so many 
avenues that you can take to get involved in the outdoors. So that's what I try to do with the segment um, Outdoor Life with Tess. Would you say that covering this beat has made you a more well-rounded journalist and has it inspired others in your profession to similarly cover the beat, you would say? Sure. And, you know, I've always said that you have to relate to anybody when you go on a story, you know, you, you can't be better than somebody or not as good as somebody you have to be. You're the same level, no matter what. So I feel like I already kind of had a well-roundedness, but this has definitely given me an avenue where I know something about it, but I don't know everything. So, you know, I know enough that I can, I can pick out a story that I know is interesting but I'm not the expert, so I know how to find the expert and get the answers and share it with viewers in a way to make them interested. Because, you know, I mean, you might talk about, you know, an invasive species and people might think, well, why does that, how does that affect me? Why do I care? And so my job is to figure out why that's going to impact, you know, our viewer. So, yeah, I absolutely think it's made me more well-rounded and, and honestly relatable um, because, I don't just do it for work. I'm living that life every day when I walk out of the building. I'm going out and I'm doing all of the things that I'm reporting on in the outdoors <laughs> that are legal. I, I guess I should clarify that. I'm, I'm hunting, I'm fishing, I'm noodling, and then I'm getting to cover it in, in work every day. Have you noticed other journalists kind of picking up this beat I've seen it a little bit myself across the country and, and a little bit in like national media too, but would you say that more and more people in the profession are starting to cover this? I definitely, yeah. So I definitely have seen it kind of um, on, a, on a more local level um, here in Oklahoma and then some of the surrounding states, which I think is great. Whenever I started at News on 6 and when I started covering these stories, no one else was doing it. Uh, we just, it, they just didn't, you didn't see these types of stories. You didn't see a story about a 93 year old man going hunting. They just weren't done. And I don't think it's, I think it's because there just was nobody who was that interested in it behind the scenes. And, um, and, and then there were some people who would put their foot down and say, you know, I don't, don't want that to happen. I don't want that story to air for, for whatever reason, but people are now understanding that, hunting and fishing in the outdoors. I mean, it is deeply rooted tradition and heritage for a lot of people. And so, yes, I have definitely seen kind of it pick up steam and that makes me excited to know that other people are kind of following suit, whether it's because of me or maybe they found their own interest in the outdoors. I don't know, but I am excited to see that outdoors being highlighted more on, you know, local television news or even national news. I've seen it nationally because everyone has started to realize or they found out that there's a conservation funding mechanism and laws that encourage uh, people to spend products uh, through these excise tax systems. So it's amazing to see them discover this. And and I could be like, or we could be like, you guys didn't know this. This is really funny. So a lot of people are playing catch up and they see that, whoa, there's a funding mechanism with this. So I think that's why a lot of them are now forced or feel obligated to cover the beat. That's my perception nationally. <laughs> Anytime you get something political involved, <laughs> it becomes interesting for some folks, right? Right. Yes. No, but it, it's funny. They don't, people don't know that the the funding, um, not so much uh -huh. the politics, the, the funding is tremendous. How much money is, I know in Oklahoma, you guys uh, talk about those figures too. Virginia, we have it here. Like people don't know how much billions of dollars go back to conservation funding through hunting and fishing. Oh, absolutely. And and that's, you know, a big part of the message that we try to to let people know. But also, you know, here in Oklahoma, our wildlife department doesn't get any um, money from the state taxes. It's all from the sales of hunting and fishing licenses and sporting goods that are connected to the outdoors. And I think that really blows people's minds. Now, I'm I have some concerns that that may shift and, and it may change at, at some point, but right now that's the way things are going. And, and I think it's impressive and a real true testament to the impact that the people who are out there in the woods or out there on the water are making toward wildlife. Yes, people do have a place on the landscape. And I did see a report that uh, nationally, I think the figures are down for hunting. Fishing is increasing. It's a little easier to access, fewer barriers to entry. Um, but that's always like a prevailing conversation, kind of separate from our talk 
uh, here on the podcast, <laughs> but more positively, even, even though, cause like back and forth, I hear this from industry professionals who say, how can we fix this? How can we do this? I think there are remedies. I think folks like you who are telling these stories, highlighting new people can help on the messaging side, but they need to figure out how to, to do it on the business side and scale these activities even more. Um, and I think mm-hmm. we are starting to break through in that respect, but more positively, you have been highlighting people. I remember you showed a montage at our dinner uh, during your keynote and you were highlighting, you know, different stories of local kids who are shooting these impressive bucks or, harp, you know, reeling in these big, impressive fish. Has there been a story in your 11 years, especially as covering the outdoor beat that has stuck out to you or something more short term, a story that really just kind of resonated you and, and left an impact? Yeah. Okay. So that, I mean, it's so hard because I feel like I, I get very tied and connected to every story that I do and, and to the people that I meet along the way. I mean, these especially these outdoor stories, because they're inviting me into their homes and to their hunting blinds and to their secret places and uh, trusting me to tell their story. So it's it's different than just my typical day turn of a story. Um, I'm really investing and becoming friends with the people. So, oh, it's just really hard. I, I did one um, about seven years ago. I went out with a 93-year-old man um, on a deer hunt. And it was a story about Oklahoma's hunting heritage and its history. And it was from the perspective of a man who in the 1920s was hunting with his family because that was the only way they could eat. And um, and kind of getting that perspective. And then there was a time in Oklahoma where, you know, there were no deer around anymore and they had to close hunting and then the repopulation. And so we got to cover all of those things together. And then I got to go out on a hunt with him and, um, he passed, he did get a deer, I should say. And he got it very quickly. I mean, we had sat down for maybe two minutes and he, a doe stepped out and he, he was able to take a perfect shot and, um, harvest that deer, but he passed away a couple of years later and that was his last deer hunt. And so what an honor to get to, um, it kind of makes me emotional, honestly, talking about it, but what an honor that I got to go with him and be with him that day. And then now his family has that story to always remember, not only his last hunt, but also to get to the, hear the history of his life hunting in the twenties and, you know, having to stop hunting because, you know, there were no more deer, there were no more wildlife in the state. And, and then to see it come back and get to, to harvest a deer at 93 years old with a cane in one hand and a shotgun in the other. Um, it, it was that, that one has always really stood out to me. Um, and, and always will Wilson Cole was his name. So that was special. And then more recently, I mean, just yesterday, I spent most of my day out on the water on Grand Lake fishing for an invasive species that are in some of the waterways in the U S called big head carp, which I really had no, no idea even existed until a couple of uh, months ago when a local fishing guide snagged one and then he just turned it into his mission to get them out of Grand Lake in Oklahoma. And so since about March, he's caught nearly 60 big head carp. Wow. And um, yeah, so I was able to to reel one in and he caught one and reeled one in too. So we took two big head carp out of the water and the wildlife department here in Oklahoma says, you know, if you catch one, do not put it back in. They're doing research right now. And I only, I only got to shoot part of the story. So I've got to get with the biologist. So I can't tell you everything about it. Um, but that experience was very cool. And so that was just one yesterday. I try to get out and shoot outdoor stories as much as I can when they come to me. It's an enviable position to be in. (laughs) <laughs> and, and and I remember, I didn't get to meet this gentleman, but I wrote about this guy's story here in Virginia. There was a similar elderly gentleman. I think he was in his hundreds uh-huh. and he was still hunting. And I think he passed away in recent years, but he made it over a hundred years and got a very nice buck. And it was such a really endearing story. I wish I could have been the journalist to tag along him, but it, it, those stories are really, really endearing. And that's so cool that you got to do that too. Um, and, and you mentioned Oklahoma species like this invasive carp, noodling, um, you talked about the plethora of different species, um, not only when we were talking and getting to know each other more, but also during your talk. I didn't realize how many species, diverse amount of species, wildlife that Oklahoma had. You were telling me and sharing with me. So so what are some of the offerings for people who are curious, interested, want to fish, hunt Oklahoma? Well, the spoonbill in Oklahoma, I think, sets the state apart. Now, there are other states that have spoonbill, but Oklahoma has really kind of like 
garnered the attention of being the spoonbill capital of the world, probably the wildlife department spent more than 15 years researching the fish and knows more about spoonbill or paddlefish now um, than it, than ever before, and probably more than any other researchers in the country. So all of that's being done. Oklahoma Keystone Lake holds the world record paddlefish. I think it was 164 pounds or 168. Uh, I, it was one or the other. I'd, I'd have to look it up to remember for sure. So that's one thing that I really think um, stands out. But Oklahoma also has deer, pronghorn. Obviously, it has deer. That's not a surprise. But it has um, pronghorn elk, black bears, turkey, of course, and alligators. People are very surprised to hear that there are alligators, but there is a native population in far southeastern Oklahoma, and um, you can't hunt alligator in Oklahoma, but we do have them. Uh, Shovel-nosed sturgeon is another fish that you can find in um, the Arkansas River, and I think it was uh, uh, an angler caught one actually fishing. I mean, I think he was just you know, fishing for whatever bites. He had a worm on the line and um, and caught a shovel nose sturgeon. And that kind of introduced the state to like, okay, these are still here in the water. And that that spurred a research, research project as well. So um, there's just so much and there are so many different um, regions and um, like the geography here is just so much different. I mean, you can go out to Western Oklahoma where it's completely flat and you've got nothing but sand. And then you go down to southeastern Oklahoma and you're in the mountains. So um, it just, it provides a lot. It's one of the most ecologically diverse states in the country. What is happening with paddlefish caviar? You had alluded to something because I, I know that people have written about, I've seen it in like Field and Stream, Outdoor Life. They've talked about like, oh my gosh, this unique kind of like byproduct uh -huh. of paddlefish fishing. Uh, so what is happening with paddlefish caviar for those who are unaware? Okay, so when the state opened its paddlefish research center 15 years ago, it, they offered a deal to anglers where um, if an angler caught a fish, the paddlefish research center would come and they'd take it and they would clean it there, but they kept the paddlefish eggs, the row. And and that's what funded the research center for 15 years because they would take the eggs and they would make caviar and they would sell it um, mostly um, in maybe like Japan or China. And um, I mean, it made millions of dollars for years and years. So um, now there's they're, they're basically sturgeon caviar has taken hold and paddlefish caviar is not as desirable as it once was. And they're, they're raising these in farms, raising sturgeon um, in hatcheries. And so um, there's just not a market for the paddlefish caviar like there once was. So the research center, they've done their research and it's closed down on the paddlefish. No longer is the state coming in and picking up your paddlefish and cleaning it for you and taking the eggs. Uh, but they are continuing to do research on other fish and and some paddlefish research as well. So the pa paddlefish caviar is amazing. I've had it and um, it is a delicacy and there are strict regulations as well on, um, you know, the average angler removing row and taking it. You can only take a very small portion and you have to leave the rest in the waterway where you found it. So um, even though the state's not doing that anymore. There's the restrictions remain for how the angler can take caviar from a paddlefish. That's fascinating. I, I I would assume, yeah, because maybe market demand, as you alluded to, is down, so they can amend, you know, their research um, with respect to. It. So that was really fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else you'd like my listeners to know? Um, how they can best connect with you? What else would you like to add, Tess? Well, um, so you can find me on social media, Facebook or Instagram, Tess Mani, M-A-U-N-E. It doesn't really look like it sounds. Um, and I know, I think you were, you're interested in, you know, if other people wanted to get into covering the outdoors, the best way to do that, I would say to one, um, make connections at your state's wildlife department and also get out in the community. I mean, there's tons of Facebook groups probably for every state that are hunting and fishing centric and get to know some of the people who are involved in the outdoors and maybe some of the groups. I mean, it could be something like even POMA or um, NWTF or Pheasant Forever, Quail Forever. I mean, there's so many groups out there that are 
focused on wildlife conservation and hunting and fishing, that it would be easy to get into that world and the stories will just keep coming. That is true. Yeah, you have to embed yourself in the outdoors to cover it truly. And whenever I see people in the media cover something, they they use the wrong terminology or it sounds like they have no understanding of the issue at hand. I'm like, you did not spend time with the people. You're misrepresenting them. Perhaps you don't know the sport. And I'm just like, it makes me kind of like shake. Sometimes it can like, be cringy. Me, cringy. <laughs> it's, it's cringe. And I'm like, oh, you obviously did not go to the outdoors. You didn't talk to someone. Uh, you maybe misconstrued what this is. So yes, in the field activity really does enhance your reporting or talking it to does. the people closest to like the the land or to the locations or to the fishery or the different wildlife that you're writing yeah. about. Well, and I think, you know, just ask to go along, you know, maybe, maybe you spend a day in your, on your off day, you know, fishing. That's not a bad way to spend the day. That way you can kind of understand what's going on. Um, and I can just promise you, I mean, you do it once and you're going to want to do it again. It's really addictive. I mean, I was fishing since I was a little girl, since I was eight years old. So I always had an interest. And now that I can do it in my profession too, as a freelance journalist, like I love it. I love any time I can do it. I don't get to do it as much as I'd like to. I cover other related outdoor conservation topics, but I still get uh -huh. to fit in some hunting and fishing on occasion, even in my travels and do it off time. But it really is like such a wonderful experience, especially how stressful things are today. And being by the water is really good for your health as is being surrounded by green spaces. So people, whether they're journalists or not, um, should take advantage of going outdoors. Sure. Like it's important to do that. Yeah. And I mean, there's plenty of urban outdoor options as well. So, you know, you don't have to go far from the city to do it. I mean, you can find things to do right, you know, within your city usually uh, to enjoy it as well. So I just encourage folks to just know that there are stories out there um, and, and they're important to tell and it's important to showcase and to highlight the outdoors in a way where people can understand that, you know, hunters that aren't going out there just to kill a deer for some, you know, bloodthirst or anything like that. There's a reason behind it. Uh, we're eating the meat. We are putting dollars back into wildlife conservation efforts. There's, it's just such a huge thing, such an important thing that we're doing and to try and, and explain that and to show people, I mean, that's the best way to do it is to just show them this is what we're doing and this is why, and here's the outcome and see, it's not so bad, you know, watch this kid smile, you know, when he realizes he has just provided meat for his family for the next month. It doesn't get better than that. <laughs> It doesn't, no. And then you get to see that the people actually have a connection to the food they're harvesting. Mm -hmm. And the grip and grin, I know that's very controversial. I've talked to people who like grip and grins, who don't like grip and grins. I'm fine with them. I try to be very tasteful. But I think showcasing your so-called trophy, you know, it's very subjective. And it could be anything small, inconsequential, or big, inconsequential. And I think it's fine that people show it. As long as it's tasteful, you harvested things legally um, you should yep. be very proud of the that catch or that harvest. Um, and, and like you said, it goes back to a greater cause. Um, these monies mm -hmm. are not improperly stewarded there. I think it was reported that excise taxes collected on these outdoor goods are actually very popular. Um, people don't like paying taxes, but they're like the manufacturer's taxes here that the manufacturers pay um, through these you know expenditures we make. People see that those monies go directly mm -hmm. as intended to the state wildlife agencies. They're stewarded very well. So it's a very successful program, this conservation model we have in place. Oh, absolutely. And anglers, hunters and, and anglers want that. They want to put their money into it. As, as it should be. Tess, you are a tremendous voice for the outdoors. And I hope you can continue to cover this beat and inspire others in journalism, whether it's local news or national news to cover this. And I hope people see what you're doing and they try to replicate your efforts. Continue to tell these awesome stories. And anytime you want to come back on the program, please let me know. We'd love to have you back. Awesome. And you keep up the great work. You're, you're making uh, huge waves as well. And I appreciate you. Thanks for having me on there. And I'm glad we get to follow each other on social media so I can keep up. Likewise. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Make sure you're connected to us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And also on your preferred player, we recommend Apple Podcasts, where you can leave us reviews if you really like the content. 
share the podcast with friends who may be interested in learning more about what's trending in conservation and the related industries that entangle with it and sometimes work against it as well. Thanks for listening to the show and stay tuned for the next episode.